Welcome, everybody, to another session of the Inner Circle Bible Study. Uh, we're glad you could make it tonight. Uh, a couple of quick things I want to share with you guys. If you are available around 6 o'clock on Tuesday nights and you're on Facebook, look up The Word with Friend. Uh, our brother, um, Raphael Cratch, does a great study. He's been teaching on the Holy Ghost this last, uh, he's been going on like four or five weeks teaching on the Holy Ghost. So catch that. It's called The it's called uh, The Word with Friends, um, live at 6 o'clock. It's only about 6 to 6.30 usually on Facebook. Uh, also, uh, we are about to wrap up this series. Um, our brother Andrew Brimbell from down south uh, with Life Church, Life Stand Church is going to teach tonight on the family. Also, on Friday nights, I believe, I'll let him share that, but on Friday nights, is their study, um, as well as their son Abdul's study is on Thursday. So those are the, we want to, we're going to try and get those loaded to our website, that all those links that you can get to pretty easily just by going to our website. Also, um, in two weeks, we have a community outreach event at the Niceville um, Fairgrounds, used to be home of the Mullet Festival. We're going to do, it's called the Niceville Bazaar. You've got if you're out that day and you're with your family from 10 to 4 at the Mullet Ground Festival Grounds, we're going to have a booth out there. We're going to be giving out free hugs, cardboard testimonies, praying for people, just being an outreach in the community and just loving on people. That's that's pretty much the gist of it. Uh, so if you're out in Niceville on the 21st of October, come join us. Come say hi, hang out, whatever. Um, there's going to be lots of food, family, and fun. There's a whole there's like 50 or 60 different food vendors, um, a lot of stuff going on that day. Also, um, the, let me check real quick. Our Christmas celebration is going to be on, make sure I get it right, December 16th at Milligan Assembly, Family Life Center in the back. We're going to have that. That is going to be our year end huge event. We will have a lots door prizes for encounter folks those who have been through encounter those who have served all that stuff so we'll get that announcement out soon um so those of you who have been through we'd love to have you um and if you haven't been through then you have an opportunity at the end of this month october 27th and 29th is the women's encounter so get signed up for that servers if you're out there Get signed up because we're going to need you to. We need lots of workers. And the following weekend, November 3rd through the 5th, is a men's encounter. So all you guys around here that have never been, go ahead and get signed up. No, don't fake the phone. Don't put joshing around. It's hunting season, but it's okay. The deer will still be there after that weekend, and you'll be mm -hmm. set free. Be good. So we encourage you to come out and join us uh, for a great, great weekend in the Lord. So without further ado, we will let Andrew get started. I'll let him take off the rest of this, and uh, I'll try to sit back and be quiet. Love y'all. All right. How you guys doing? <laughs> I'm not as good as my wife, but I'll try to pull it off. <laughs> uh, you're pretty snazzy, dude. All right, let's open up for the work prayer. Father God, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you. As we dig into your word, Lord God, that you will enlighten our hearts today, Father, Lord God. Eliminate us to the fullest, Father, Lord God, that we may understand what, what your word says, Father, Lord God. And we may be able to apply it to our life, Lord God, to make it better, make us better disciples for you, Father, Lord God. And we just give you all the glory and the honor, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. That's my page. Okay, so the first one I got is for the man is a warrior. So we can look at um, Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. It says, the Lord is a warrior. Yeshua is his name. So Christ is a man of war or a warrior being engaged in war having to do with a very with a very powerful enemy satan and his principalities and power the world and get and and the great man of it 
the Antichrist and all of the Antichrist state. A warrior well invest in all arts of war and the ability to qualify for it, having having wisdom, strength, and courage through uh, oh through through having the full armor of um, <laughs> the armor of um, breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the garment of Okay, the the garment of band. What's that word there? I can't see. The garment, of the garment of vengeance and a clock of seal, and a virtuous dipped in blood, and with a sword gift of his of his, and a sword with a with a sword. Gift on girt on his ties or down or coming out of his mouth and with a bow and arrow going forth conquering and conquer for he is victorious he is a victorious one who has conquered sin Satan and the world and will substitute all others and make his people more than conquerors through him. So it's saying through Christ, the only way we could be a man of warrior because Christ, he was a man of warrior. He conquered, he gave us the, the, um, the full armor of God and he was able to conquer Satan's. When he got on that cross, I think he kind of messed up the, the devil was in the shock news. Instead of he thinking that he took Christ out, he really made more Christ when Satan went down there and, and um, took the keys from him. He was in a shock mode. He was like, man, you know, I think he was like parading. Look at it has him parading around with all the demons down there saying, yes, we got him. We got him. But when Christ walked down, when Christ got down there, it was a different story. You know, he, he put on a, a whipping on, G, uh, on the devil that he was able to conquer him through that. And the only way as men that we could be that is through him. He's the captain, the Lord of hosts. He's the leader, the commander of the people in the armies in the heaven and earth and in the prince. And he is a prince and a king at, at the head of, of them. And the Lord name is Jehovah which is proved to be more than a man. And being so, it is no wonder that he is so powerful, mighty, and victorious. So through the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be the warrior he has called us to be. So the only way we can be that is through Jesus Christ. And I wrote down some characteristics of a warrior and some habits of a warrior that we need to be as a godly man for this warrior. And one of them is um, prayer life, understanding and using of intercession, love of justice, truth and righteousness, strength of faith through God's word, Peace found through God, worship and praise, um, united with the body of Christ, fellowshipping with believers, um, relationship with God as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, heart knowledge that they are heirs of God you know we're we're heirs of God a lot of us we don't walk in that um the full armor of God godly wisdom the fruit of the spirit and kingdom view 
and kingdom-based goals. And with all these, as a man, we need to we need to have that in our family. You know, sometimes we 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 let everything gets in the way, like even with TV. You know, you think about it. Look on Sundays. Sundays we got. I don't know who's a NASCAR fan or a football fan. That's four hours right there that they're robbing from us, from our family. You know, we all get back in the days. I know that's a, that's our time. We all used to hang out and, and, and the kids did whatever they want to do. And then the uh, wife did whatever they want to do. And the guy stuck to the TV watching the game for four hours. So I look at it when I um, when I totally surrender myself over. I looked at it. It was like, man, I just wasted four four hours, sometimes even more. And then if you're hooked on on both, I got four hours in NASCAR and I got four hours in in a, a football game. That's eight hours. So I was like, man, all this stuff just rob you from what you're supposed to be like. Take you off. We could even see. As in, as the war happened in Israel, they was all with their family. They was all they wasn't looking out, right? There was nobody looking out, and because they was they was doing their thing with their family, they was um, occupied, and that's what the enemy does. He he lets our mind be occupied so much with all these things that the world has to offer us that it try it keeps us away from the family. It draws us out from the family. Instead, it'll be better hey, if all your families together watching a football game versus, you know, separation because one don't want. And um, I could even this weekend, this past Sunday, we went to one, we went to our, our regular church that we go to, and then we got invited for a, a lunch. And then after that, we ended up going to another church for another service. But it was so ministry to just spend the whole day with God because we, after we left that service, we was surrounded ourselves with godly men and godly women and godly kids. And it was so cool to just spend the whole day in the God atmosphere, you know. And I felt that like you felt growth. And we haven't seen the um, the outcome of that, you know. We had a guy that prophesied over us and he was like, whoa, you know. And I think if we if we, if we didn't choose that way, if I didn't choose that as a man of the house and say, you know what, I'm going to go home, we'll go watch football, and we're going to, you know, have our dinner, and that's it. But let's choose no. I was like, let's go. I want to go into the house of God. And and that's like one of the true thing of a warrior. You still, you're, still, um, you're still being on guard. You never let your guard down. Because as soon as you let one little guard down, the enemy could come in a flood. And we've seen that in the natural this weekend in Israel, you know. So that's one. That's one of the worry of the first one was the or the warrior. The next one I have the man is the covering, and we can see that in um, First Corinthians eleven three. It says, "But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every person, and Adam." the head of Eve as God is the head of the Messiah. <laughs> this one, I know if we have any, me, I, I like to, if you want to jump in, you guys could jump in anytime because I sometimes it helps me move better versus me explain everything and we go. So if you guys got anything, just jump on it. If God's giving you, did you say, did you say that was first Corinthians 11, three? Yes. Okay. TPT? Yep, in the passion. Yep. Okay. I'm just trying to make sure. I'm going to try to add them in the uh, chat window so that way if somebody missed it or didn't hear it, then that way they can go look it up as well. Okay. The head is not being used as a head over like a chief or a ruler. The way how the word head is being used here means source. Christ is the source of our, of our life. And our faith. The source of the woman is the man, for we can see that Eve was taken from Adam. The source of Christ is God, for he provide he provided a virgin birth for him. 
so that we can so do, so that we can see we all need a covering even Christ needed a covering he needed he needed God to be his covering so um as the man we're supposed to be the head of the house and then i think some guys takes that out to to the head they took it to the wrong head <laughs> that's how i could put it they think that it's like a rulership like like i said it's a chief or a ruler god didn't want a man to be a ruler over his wife he called her to be the helper he made her to be the helper so therefore a helper you don't try to control the helper or or how you may say um put the helper down you know it's a helper you appreciate it you you, you admire that help you're so thankful that god sent you that helper so you wouldn't want to do anything to where it would um, affect or make her feel like the weakest, the weaker vessel. She is the weaker vessel, but you're not supposed to make her feel that way. And a lot of us guys, go ahead. I don't want to cut you off. Sorry, I was letting you go. No, no, go ahead. No. So <clears throat> First Corinthians 11.3 talks about he's establishing order, right? Yeah. The order of things. There's a print. God comes first and then man and then woman, right? But if you go down to verse 11, it says, nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man and the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes to woman, but all things are from God. So that that right there establishes that they're, they're equal but separate. And I always look at it like this. Like if there's an established order, that means that when um, correction uh, when <laughs> responsibility, those things fall down from that order, right? And and yeah. I'm going to be re held responsible for my wife and for my children and what I did with them as a man in the family uh, in the family nucleus. I'm going to be held responsible for that one day, right? Yes. So I look at it from this aspect: if my wife is not happy, there's a probably a large percentage of the reason is because of me because uh, is it that i'm not i'm not loving her like like i'm supposed to as christ loved the church you know you can get into that and it talks about in ephesians i think ephesians 5 talks about man shall love the woman and, and woman shall respect the man yes There's a whole dynamic there that goes on you know and if we don't understand that if we think that we're you know above them <laughs> yeah you'll never You'll never good, give a good luck. I, th I think <laughs> folks just need to just need to read a few more verses. <laughs> yeah, we never we will never be able to do what God has called us to do. You won't be able to love her right. She won't be able to feel that love because you're more of a, a chief over her, a ruler over her. So how can you be able to put let her feel the love that God has for you? Because remember, God says. Love your wife as I love the church. How do we, how do he loves us? The same way. Um, we come to him all broken. We come to him all messed up. And he still loves us. Through his love, we change, right? Through his love, we're able to be able to be, um, to turn into the man and woman of God that he has called to be. And the only way that could have been was through love. There's no way that you could change somebody by just telling them. And that's what us men sometimes we try to do is to try to change the woman how we want her to be. But God never said to change her. He said, love her. And when you love somebody the same way, when we love him, we, we change because we know these stuff will affect them. You know, it will it will hinder our it says um, if a man. Um, if a man is not. I forgot where how it was where it hinders your prayer. If you're not well, if you're not walking right with your wife, it can hinder your prayer. First Peter, First Peter, right? So I don't want my prayers to be hindered. So I just ask God every day. That's one of my prayers. Like, hey God, show me how I can make sure that I meet my wife's needs. You know, mm -hmm. to be able to because. If God meets our needs every day, 
we should be praying the same thing to meet our our uh, wife and our kids need. There's no uh, there's no difference in that. As us praying to him. And um, even as Adam, you saw he took he took Adam's rib. He, he didn't take he didn't take um, Adam's head and made Eve. He took a rib. The reason why he took the rib to bring her on the side. And when we we did that a couple weeks. The last couple of weeks we've been talking about Adam and Eve, where he brought her into him as a helper. So that's all I have. For the man, the covering. It's First Peter three seven. Yes, yeah. First three, Peter. It says the same way. You husband must honor your wives, treat your wife with understanding, and you live together. As you live together, she may be the weak, weaker than you are, but she is equal partner in God's gift of your new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. So, right there, he's telling you, you got to treat her. How do you? Um, how do we treat fine China? We treat her real good, right? We don't just throw it inside the uh, inside the um, sink or inside the garbage like paper plates or our old plastic bowls. No. We make sure we wash it and put it in and dry it and make sure we put it up nicely in the cabinet. The same way God wants us to be able to treat our wives like fine china, you know. Um, and as you pour your love, I know Tony Evans, I will say some woman needs a little bit more soaking, a little bit more love to break off all those bondage because, you know, we all come into a relationship. We may be coming with some baggage that we have before, you know, like a woman got hurt. She might got hurt from her, her dad, her past relationship. And there's some work that you would have to do as a man to be able to get her to, to help her, to get her to where God wants her to be. And the only way we could do that is through love. There's nothing else that will help her, but that love, that love will start changing her. It'll start, breaking down those walls the same way as we became Christian. When we became Christian, we had all those walls up. Be at the beginning of our, our salvation, we had all those walls up, and it was hard for people to even get through to us until God started soaking us, soaking us in that love and soaking us in his presence. Then those walls start falling down. So the same way as men, we have that responsible to do that for our wives. Amen? Amen. Hey, Andrew. Yeah. Real quick, you're talking about washing, right? <laughs> That's yeah. funny. funny you mentioned Tony Evans because that guy, I love that. <laughs> He's an awesome teacher. Um, but if you look in Ephesians 5, uh, Ephesians 5, 25 and 26, and 26 is what I'm looking at. But it says, the word uh, Ephesians 5, 25 and 26, it says on uh, verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for her. So if Christ gave himself for us, then as men, as are we doing that for our wives? Because that's essentially what he's saying. But it then goes on to say that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water, washing of water by the word. Are we doing that? Are we are we that that's the priest part, I I believe, of, of being the, the priest in the home? You know, I, I think too many times. As, and I'm not trying to man bath here, but too many times as men, we want to, we want all the benefits of being a man, but we don't want to do all the work. Right? Yes. We, we want all the stuff. We want her to, to honor us and to obey us and, and, and submit to us and all those, all those fancy words, right? But we don't want to uphold our end of the bargain because really it's not a bargain. It's a, it's a unity. It's a teamwork. And the more I think once we realize and understand that the more that we do for her, not because we have to, but because we want to, there's a huge difference between having to and want to, then it's so much easier because now it will be reciprocated. So now we're starting that motion and we're not doing it because 
well, because she shows me respect, that's why I'm going to show her love. No, you do that because that's what Christ says to do, because Christ's already done it for us as the example. So if we'll just obey what he says and and give our give ourselves as he gave him give himself for us, then you'll start to see things start to unfold. You'll start to see blessings unfold. You'll start to see things come to pass that you didn't even have to say anything about, you know, and you, you'll be blessed in those manner that it, it's just, it almost works itself out because that's what it's supposed to do. That's what happens when the Holy Ghost gets involved and he, and then you allow him to, to, to do what he's supposed to do on your life while you allow him to do, uh, you know, bring the reckoning to us. So to speak. Amen. All right, we're gonna go down to the father. The, fa the husband is the uh, man is the father. I just want to. Uh, I was putting this one just in case um, some people don't understand what is a father. A father is a male parent of a child. You cannot be a father unless you are a male. <laughs> so. <laughs> I just wanted to put that out there, but we we can be kingdom father. We have a, we have to be able to let God be the father to us before. Sorry, before we could be a kingdom father, we have to let God be able to be the father to us. In Second Corinthians six eighteen. It says, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be a son and daughter to me, says the Lord Almighty. So right there in, in 2 Corinthians 6, 18, he's saying, hey, I want to be that father to you. A lot of men, especially if you haven't been in this society where we got such a broken, we come from mostly broken back broken families that some guys don't know how to accept a father they don't know how to accept that father's love and when they come they bring that that into their into their family when they do get married when they do get a family and they don't know how to be a father because they never had a father to be able to show them the love to show them how to be a man how to be a kingdom dad and the only way we could do that is to allow Christ to be able to show that to us. And that only way we could do that, too, is to be able to surrender ourselves fully to him, to be able to let him be the father to us first, before we could be able to be a father to our kids. Um, in 2 Samuel seven fourteen to 15, I will be, I will be a father to him, and he'll be a son to me. When he does wrong, I will discipline him, in a in the usual way. The pitfalls and the obstacles of the moral life, but I'll never remove my glorious love for him. Oh, sorry. Gracious love for him. So no matter what we do, no matter how, how many times we fall, God will never take away that love for us. And with us men, it's hard. Sometimes I know when it was when I first became a father, it was hard for me to to know that. Like I used to beat myself up when I made a mistake because I was like, man. I don't want to be like that father. I don't, you know, I don't want to be like those guys out there. I want to be the best dad to do everything. What I didn't, what my dad didn't do for me, I want to do better for my kids. And I used to be, beat myself over and over with that because I didn't understand that love. My love, my way of um, loving was more like um, trying to buy them everything. And that kind of, like my oldest one, I feel like I, I kind of missed the ball on them. I think I was telling I was telling my older daughter today, I'm like, you know what? I, I, I was telling her a husband. I was like, you know what? I didn't get enough time with my older ones because I was morally trying to work long hours, trying to make them happy by spending 
given being able to have that money to do things with them. And they didn't want that. They want all they wanted was a daddy dear, you know. And um, as men, we got to know that all they want is us there to be able to talk to someone to be able to to love on them. And I, I beat myself up over that all the time. Cause I'm like, man, should have did better. But it's never too late to start. So I started and it's working. I can see the fruits growing in them now versus when it was. As we learn to be a son of God, we will become kingdom fathers by letting him lead us in his will and trusting in his word and walking in obedience with him. We will be able to bring up kids in the right ways. So the only way we can bring these kids up is through the father. First, we got to go through the father. And like every day, I pray for them too. That's on my prayer list. In the morning, I pray for my wife, my kids, you know, God help me to meet those needs that they need, you know, so I don't slack. And then, um, I've been doing for the last month. Has it been the last month or two? I've been doing Psalms 91. Oh, yeah. I've been doing Psalms 91 with the kids. And every day as we go to school, I have one of them either read the bio, read that Psalms out loud, and one will pray, and one will read. We have the daily Bible verse that we do for, for the day. So I'm like, maybe I'll just, maybe they're just saying it just to please me, you know, like reading it and it'll just go through one, one ear and out the other. But the other day I saw the fruits of it. My daughter says she told one of the kids in school, you need to read Psalms 111 because he was fearing something. So I'm like, man, she's told her that. I was like so excited because I'm like, man, it worked because I, I didn't feel, I didn't feel like they was doing it. Like, you know, like it's planning them, but it planted. And then today, we was out here on the patio and we was doing our devotion. I'm like, read it, but we didn't had they didn't have their uh, their Bibles with them. So they started reciting it out of their mind. They were just saying the whole scripture out. I was like, man, that's so good, you know. So I'm like, all it took was just a little time of me saying, hey, let's do this together. So us as men, we have that influence to be able to influence them into the things of God. You know, my dad always says, um, he was like, whatever you put into the kid will come out. And he was saying there was a father that was smoking pot. There was an old commercial. He always said that old commercial, was, the, the father was smoking pot and he caught his son with pot. And he was like, where did you get that from? And the kid was like, from you, dad, from your box. You know, so it was like, whatever you put in, if you put in godly thing, they will reap godly things. So as father, we do, we have one of the biggest role in a kid's life from the age, from the infant all the way up, even as they're adults, we still have influence on our kids. You know, there's some things that I feel like, like if my dad would just call me in a day or so and say, hey, you know, that it'll make my day feel good because I know he's still there thinking about me, you know. And that's why, as men, we can't be, we can't have that pride up. We have to be able to just be, be prideless when it comes to our family. No matter, especially your older kids too. If you, if they did something where it turned them away from, and you didn't agree with them, okay, be a man and man up. Say, hey, you know, we could, we can work this out. Um, I can see even with my daughter, my oldest daughter, she had moved in with us for a couple of, of days while she was getting her apartment, which I was telling Sean today, she got scammed out of it. So beware of those scams out there. Um, but I was like, man, you know, it's so different from her being, she could, she was more excited that daddy came to a rescue today, that daddy said, let's go. So I grabbed my um, friend and we're like, let's go. We're going over there and find out what's going on. And we went over there and we found out that she did get scammed out. But with me taking that thing, it made her feel felt like, hey, daddy still got me, you know? So as men, we still, we never stop being a father, basically. That's what I'm saying. We never will stop being a father. Once you're a father, you will always be a father. And we will, and the thing is, we still got to show that godly love. 
because today she was there. She was like, man, you know, I would usually get all upset and all this. I'm like, you know what? That's the peace. That's the peace of God on you right there. And because you know what? You're under my covering right now. You're under that peace. And like in life, when life comes at you and hit you that way, you need to walk. Let that peace of God fall on you like that in every situation that you go. So it was amazing just to see that with from the youngest to the oldest, how God is operating as me, as a man surrendering up to uh, onto God. If I didn't surrender, it would have been a whole different story. You know, I'd be teaching them different things. Like the oldest one, they just saw me. Dad was only coming home and he's on the front court drinking a beer. That's all they saw was their dad was, oh, I'll put on some TV, cook us some dinner, and I'm out on the porch. You know, that's all they saw. With the oldest one, with the youngest one now, they see dad, oh, he's seeking after God. He's doing the things in God's hand. And I'm seeing them reaping. I'm seeing the the blessing of God fall on them for me, sir. Um in Proverbs, and it says we can see in Proverbs, oh, that Proverbs 22, verse 6. Start children off on the way they should go. And even when they're older, they will not turn from it. And I seen that today, like I said again, with my oldest daughter, how she was um, still working with um, God in her life. Even though she's, she might messed up, but she still came back to the things of God. And even me, I was a living example of that too. I went my own ways and I came back. My dad and mom plant, planted Christ into me and I came back to Christ when things was, when I didn't have no other way out, you know? It was Christ that I knew that set me, that was my way back to him. So it's never too late, guys. As men, we could we could always change things around. And you start showing that love the same way. We're the one that set the um, thermostat, right? As a, as the head, we set those thermostat. It's not always that we set the thermostat for the women, and then we set the thermostat for the for the um, kids. And you will start seeing. If you, if you feel like, hey, man, I messed up, just ask God for forgiveness and be a man. Ask God, ask your kids for forgiveness. I remember when I came back from the encounter, the first thing I did was call all my kids together and I washed their feet. And I told them, I'm sorry for whatever, whatever which way that I raised you the wrong way. I am so sorry. And I repented to God when I was at the encounter. And when I came back, I repented to them for any, any things that I may cause them to drift the wrong way, you know, because of my action. All right. <laughs> I mean, we're going to move on to the husband now, the role of the husband as a man. And I think we covered some of this in, uh, in the early one. And it says, um, one of our favorite, favorite verse that we like is um, Ephesians 5.25. And to the husband, you are to demonstrate the love for your wives with the same tender devotion that Christ demonstrates to us as his bride. For he died for us and sacrificed himself. A husband is to demonstrate his love in such a way that models his wife into a helper that God has intended her to be and the only way we can do this is by our unconditional love you know it's it's hard for our for us men to sometimes love our wives unconditionally you know i know um sometimes my wife would be like can you not just um how you say it how do you say it, how do you say it? i don't know what you say when you say um, unconditional, um, not expecting, there you go. Can you love or, or, um, or do something for me where it's not ex expecting something, you know? Or if we're going on a date, don't expect it to go all the way to the, to the, to the end, you know? Just, just be my best friend. 
Right. And, uh, and just right. talk to me, you know? Girl power. <laughs> Girl power. <laughs> just talk, conversate. <laughs> but sometimes it's us men, it's hard for us to do that, you know? And as we love, as we learn how to love them unconditionally, you will reap benefits, you know? Like the guy says, the smiley face, you will get a lot of smiley face from. No, you don't. Laugh, <laughs> laugh your way to a better marriage. You ever heard the guy smiley face? So, uh, <laughs> so the same way like Christ loved us, we should be loving them. It's not all about you know about smiley faces at the end of the night. <laughs> well, where are them smiley faces? <laughs> 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 all right he he also wants us to honor and treat her well i said it like fine china earlier I, 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 and um treat your wife in an understanding way where we understand like you know how god he understands no matter what he still understand. He try. He tries to pour out the love where we tr where we're understanding how he feels. You could treat her like I say. Pray. Don't let don't let your prayers be hindered because if we treat her wrong, you don't want your prayers. You know, some man is like, oh. I've been praying for this and I can't get through. I just don't feel that God is not. That God is not hearing me. Like, I'm like, so how are you treating your wife? Well, you know, I'm not, we're not, um, I'm always out of the house doing my own thing. So then, you know, you got to be able to treat her in a way where she feels that she's part of you. You know, a lot of men, we like to do our own thing. Hey. I'm going to have my fishing day, my fishing buddy, you know, do my thing. This is my spot. No, everything should be. Like, I, I listen to couples. They're like, they don't ever have their same account, bank account. So I'm like, bro, I haven't. <laughs> the first time I met my wife, even before we even got married, I, I was like, yeah, I'll put you on my bank account, you know. Just add her to my account. I didn't even know we was going to get married, but we did. <laughs> Because I trusted her so much, you know, and I trusted. You got to be able to trust God first before you can trust anybody. And I learned that from being open with her. A lot of us, we don't like to communicate with our feelings. Us men, we don't like to communicate with our feelings. We stayed all balled up and, and um, we don't tell her how we feel. What's wrong? None. What are you thinking about? None. Where is that going to get you? It's not going to get you nowhere because you're not communicating. But yet inside you're thinking, man, this and that and that and that. I know in my at our first, when we first got married, I used to be like, man, um, it was some with the older kids. I wasn't able to because Rebecca, she never had no kids. And she just jumped right in and helped me raise my two girls right up from the beginning. And um she was like, she wants it all lined out, which wasn't bad. She had very good intention on how she, how she wanted all structured, structured, and it was good. Like we had a one day for our food, what we'll, what we're gonna have for breakfast, and laid it out so it could move faster for her. So in my mind, I was like, man, this woman's like a, a she likes she just likes to rule everything. But it wasn't that the way how she likes it. She likes everything to be structured so it could move faster for her in her ways. So as we prayed and and we start to get to know each other, I always used to keep that in and I never communicated. So then when she does do something where it went to, it rubbed me the wrong way, everything comes out. It like blows up like a big old atomic bomb on her. And I was like, man, for a while, it, it was going rough because of that, because I never used to be able to communicate my feelings to her. And my life, we always was taught, like, you know, just brush it underneath the mat, forget about it, it'll go away. 
But no, in a man's and woman relationship, it never will go away. It will always rise up sometime. And no matter what kind of hurt that you've been through, if somebody else, if she hits that that nail on the head with that same thing, it will affect you. You'll feel it. So it's so important for us to communicate and be able to empty ourselves of those hurt. Tell her, hey, be honest. Like I'll tell her, not, hey, that right there, what you said really hurt, you know? And then she'll explain, you know, why I said this. Then I'll be like, oh, okay. Because the enemy is out to destroy each and every one of us. And he could twist one little thing up into like a big old thing, which it wasn't even true because of how how the enemy is. So guys, as we learn how to love her and treat her like fine china, we got to be able to be open with her, you know, be able to tell her everything that, that we're feeling. And it's hard for men to do that. But as you surrender everything over to God, we'll be able to surrender. We'll be able to have that equal partnership with our wives. And that's one of the hardest thing that we we struggle with. If you guys just marry, you guys could um, agree with me on that. Um, the man is a friend. It says a godly man encourages fellow believers. Because of his encouragement, the heart of your fellow believers and support one another, just as you have already been doing. In First Thessalonians 5.11. So this is the man as a friend. I don't know, but I have some friends where I can look back from when I used to be in the world. There was one guy that that really stand out and me and him, we just connect. I just went to, I remember went, going to his house to pick him up for work because my uncle sent him over. And um, we started fishing because he liked fishing. And I was like, yeah, I like fishing too. So every night we'll grab our rods and we're out fishing. I wasn't married or anything then. I was just 18 years old. And this guy, we, we became friends. He was like 10 years older than me, but we became such good friends and then um we started drinking together you know and at 16 no i was 16 i remember i was 16 i just came out of high school and from there his influence was more of he was cool with the fishing but then the alcohol came in there and that's how we i became an alcohol before i was even 18 i was drinking every night with this dude you know so all depends on your friends what friends you have now I have godly friends where, you know, I have a friend that called me, hey, I, mean, I heard, I, I think it was Scott. I was, he called me up and I was on the road the other day looking for some crutches. And he was like, you know what? I just drove by a place that has crutches right here, $5. I'm like, bro. He was like, you know, I was just listening. I was just listening to God that just says, hey, call Drew. And he called me at the right time when I'm looking for crutches. And I was like, man, that is God ordained. You know, that's how a godly friend is because he will feel what you're feeling. You know, God will, God will connect the souls together, even as a friend, as a brother. You know, and he'll be able to share stuff like that between each other. Um, in ecclesia, how you say it? ecclesia? How you pronounce that word right there, please? Ecclesi Ecclesiastic. Uh, Ecclesiastic, I can't say, but Ecclesiastic 410, it says, if one person falls, the other one can reach out and help him, because, but someone who falls alone is in really trouble, you know? If you're by yourself and you fall, it's hard for you to get up. If you were your brothers, like all of us guys from the encounter, when somebody falls, all we got to do is pick up the phone and say, hey, bro. Can you pray for me? Can you uh, lift me up in this prayer? Can you can you um, encourage me? You know, like you get words of encouragement. I know Friday, one Friday, Shannon says, how's everybody doing on a Friday? You know, and it was so good just for us, bro, just just to reach out and joke around godly jokes, you know, and that's what a, a, a godly man friend is. He's there to be be um, a friend that's 
able to pick you up when you're falling or when you're feeling down. I know sometimes me and Scott, we'll talk, we'll be like, hey, you all feeling this way? He's like, bro, let's pray. I got this word. Or he'll shoot me a Bible verse. Or he'll even text me a Bible verse out of blue. I'm like, bro, how you know I was feeling that way? So stuff like that, as a godly friends, you pick up on that. God does that for us. Um, Colossians 3.13. And this is one that I look like, I look at it, we shouldn't, um, we should be able to have this in every relationship. Even as a man, as a wife, as a husband, as a father, and as a friend, we should be able to make allowance for each other's fault. And forgive anyone who offends you. Remember that the Lord forgives you, so you must forgive others. Amen. And that's one of the hardest things that we as men, we, we kind of don't like to submit to that quickly to forgive somebody or quickly to say when we when we was at fault, you know, when we're when we made a boo-boo to say, hey, I'm sorry. You know, that pride kicks in. The enemy puts that pride in us. And it's hard for us to be able to say that, say that to one another, even to our wives or to our kids. But as we surrender, all, all this goes back to if we surrender everything over to God, we could be able to walk like this. We could be able to be quick to forgive, you know, quick to realize, hey, we messed up. Father, I messed up today, you know, um, and he'll forgive you. So as men, we got to be able to we got to be able to be quick to forgive our friends and leave, leave room for that for that uh, allowance when somebody do fail you, you know. Because we're all human. We're all going to make mistakes. And it's it's okay. You know, it's okay to be able to to have that. To be able to forgive one another. And it won't make you a less man if you admit to something, you know. It makes you more of a man when you're able to stand up and say, hey, I'm sorry I messed up, you know. And that's all I... <laughs> All I got right there, guys. Good job, bro. Good job. Yeah, you, yeah, Dustin said you covered a lot tonight. A lot. Hey, I got, I, I can't even write fast enough. I got four or five pages right here. Hold me quiet. No, oh, go ahead. Whoever, whatever. Chris looks like he's got something to say. He's up here with. I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll share a couple things real quick. So I, I really like how you broke down the different aspects of the man being the the warrior, the covering of him, being a friend, all those different aspects. It, it, that was a lot. Like 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 Justin said, you definitely covered a lot tonight. It's definitely a lot of a lot of steak <laughs> to chew on so to speak you know so that's that's really awesome um the one towards the end you were talking about the communication and and i think you were talking about unity right yeah like being unified across there so something that kind of it came to me this weekend and then he just brought it back up again um essentially and and the fight, the folks out there that understand anything about like welding would understand this. So I felt like the spirit was saying, um, when there's unity, it, it's it's similar to a spiritual welding. And let me explain that. So when you weld two objects together, um when you weld two objects together, number one, they have to be clean. They can't have corrosion, they can't have all sorts of foreign matter on them correct and any of you guys that are welders please tell me if i'm wrong so you have two objects they both got to be clean the second thing is, is that there has to be a good ground right so for there to be unity there has to be a good there has to be a grounding it has to be a foundation and, and if this is going to be spiritual welding, it has to be a foundation in christ and that's the word of god to me um rebecca 
resembles that so much. And when we talked about that earlier, Drew, about how her passion for the word is so strong that it's it's causing others to like come against her because it's so strong. So that that in itself to me um signifies that there, there's a strong foundation there and that grounding is there. So when there is a spiritual welding, number number one, both uh, both objects are clean. Number two, there's a good ground. And what happens when that welding process takes place is there's a blinding light. To me, that's always reason Father God. And if Father God is in the middle of that, there's nothing more that can happen other than just pure bondage that happens through the Holy Spirit and that love that's there. Um, I hope that makes sense. Went to my ear and I... I hope that makes sense. But in that, um, I just I just wanted to share that. I felt like as as we become closer, as, as we get closer to what God wants us to be as in the family unity, right? Drew, you talked about um, doing things together as a family on Sundays and, and not separating yourselves from the rest of your family to go watch football or watch NASCAR or do something else, go fishing, go hunting, stuff like that. But but take and, and make sure that the priority in your life is not the things that you want to do, but the priority in your life is your family. That's the important thing. And, and no matter what you're doing, you know, you hope that it's doing something that is uh, advancing the kingdom, that is growing your family, that is producing an environment that, that is conducive to kingdom growth. But even if it's not, if it's, hey, if it's going to the, to the go-kart track and everybody's riding together, you know, that, that's... There's there's something there. You're doing something together. You're make, making memories together. Yes, yes, and it's important, you know. I mean, just like you said, you you had the opportunity to go and be daddy again, kind of be that, you know. You had you got you got a chance to put your cape back on today, you know, and yeah. you know, and that that was a twofold purpose. So it it showed her that you're still there and that you never will go away, and it also kind of, I'm sure that it lifted up your spirit too. I mean, I can sense that it did just from when we were talking earlier that. It lifted your spirit, and man, that, it's almost like maybe I didn't do everything, and I still have opportunity. You know? Yeah, that, that's good. I'll be quiet now. Michael's got something. Go ahead, Michael. All right, so maybe I don't want to get any flame and spears thrown at me or yelled out here for this, but so Andrew, you you kind of hit on it. Sean kind of alerted a little bit when you talk about unity and spending time with your family. And, you know, you talked about, you know, going out on a date with your wife and spending time. And, you know, it's always, why do you think it always has to go to the end to finish? Why does it always have to get to that point? And, you know, something that I've, I've, I've really been studying a lot on and looking at personally in myself is, you know, we talked about putting on armor and walking out the door every day and being a warrior for your family. You know, wives, you know, significant others, close girlfriends, whatever it is you've got to understand that when we as men walk out that door, we are going to fight the world for our family. And when we walk out that door in the morning, it's completely different than when we come back home in the afternoon. And we crave intimacy from our wife and our loved ones to soften our hearts. Because if we don't get that intimacy from our wives, we become hardened. And oftentimes, intimacy is misconstrued with just a sexual relationship with your partner. And that is 100% not true. It's as simple as a hug and a kiss. When you come in the door, Hey, how was your day? I hope everything was okay. Sit down on the couch next to us, put your arms around us, you know, a kiss on the cheek. When you're riding down the road in the car, reach over and hold our hand, grab our elbow, something. Right <laughs> what you and now and I don't want the spears to come flying at me for this, but at the same time, if the only time you show us intimacy is when it is in a sexual committed relationship, then expect wholeheartedly that we are going to take advantage of it any time we can to receive that intimacy. Sure, yeah. And when 
the, if that is the only intimacy, quote unquote, that you show your husbands, and then you take it away, that is going to be a wedge between you and your husband. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it, it, you could say love language, you know, you have to learn your partner's love language, whatever it is that makes them happy. I know for myself and most men, if they're honest, they'll tell you that, you know, Andrew, like you talked about having a joint bank account. I can't, I don't even know how, I don't even know where our checkbook's at. You know, my, my wife has it. I don't know how much money's in the bank. My wife does. I can be a millionaire. I can be broke. I have no idea. <laughs> you know what I mean? But we depend on y'all for so much mm -hmm. to keep us in check, so to say, that we crave that intimacy from our wife because when we walk out the door, yes, we are warriors. And whether it's a fight to keep our job or to try to move forward in our job or to put food on the table or figure out how we're going to go to work and work 8, 10, 12 hours, 14 hours a day and come home and still get the grass cut and still make sure that the house is secure over your heads and still make sure that our kids are getting the male role model and the male leadership that they need as a father. We just need some reassurance from our wives. And it doesn't take much. It doesn't take a whole lot. And once again, just remember that if the only time you show us intimacy is that time when we're alone, then be fully and wholeheartedly ready. We're going to take advantage of it to the point that you're probably going to get tired of it. But we're not because that's the only time we get that intimacy and we crave it. I know I do. Speaking for myself, I mean, I, I need that connection with my wife. So that, that, that's kind of all I got. But yeah, that's good. Yeah, our job starts is when we walk back in that door. That's when our job, our true job, starts. You know, some guys say, "All right, I worked, and I'm coming home. All I need is my beer, my remote." No, your job starts when you come back in that door. That's your real job, you know. Michael, that was um, very profound and um, very honest. So thank you, because that is absolutely the truth. Yeah. Um, ladies, what, what Michael just said is, is so in, information. It's so informative that if, if it's not taken seriously, then I can assure you, as a man they'll find something else to supplement it. That, that intimacy that he, that men require, it, it will be, it will be supplemented somehow. And, and, and the enemy will find a way to supplement that. And right now he's doing his best to drive a wedge in the family nucleus. Be, and, and he's doing it through pornography and through lust of the flesh the original sins, he, he's going to use that in every every chance he gets. Now, guys will fight it all day long. Part of that battle that Michael talked about when he goes outside and he's a warrior, part of that battle is, is the battle he's got to fight over his own over his own vision, his over his own eyes, the lust of the flesh, the things that are out there every day. Um, and it makes it a lot easier when he knows, when a man knows that what he has at home, he knows there, there's, there's a everything that he needs is there right okay. it's not just and, and i'm glad that you said that michael that it's not just the sexual aspect of it it's so many other things you know understanding you, you said understanding the love languages what, what what does your what is your husband's love language? what is your wife's love language? what is your kid's love language? it's it's often not the same and this and the manner in which you give love is not necessarily the manner in which you receive love so understanding those things is super important. Sheila, that was a uh, very important what you said. Sheila said the rib taken from Adam not only means to walk side by side, but sometimes to walk under his arm, holding him up when he is weak, encourage him and be in his strength. That's the that's where the family comes together. That's where the unity comes together. That's where the team comes together. Like Andrew talked about, you know, it's not one is above the other. They're equal. 
right? Husband and wife are equal. They have different roles and responsibilities. Absolutely. All fall under one head. And that's Christ Jesus. Okay. Michael, Michael, thank you. That was good. Very good. Yeah, they even said if you hug somebody for 15 seconds, you feel that embrace. You know, embrace a person for 15 seconds, you'll feel the love off of that person. Can I, can you hear me? This is Sue. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Michael, that's so correct. So awesome. Thank you. I remember many years ago when my husband and I were first married and we had our daughter and I was working. He worked very, very hard. And I, after my daughter was put to bed, like at 8 o'clock, 8.30, she was a baby, put her to bed. And I went in the kitchen and I would do dishes, get things cleaned up, put a load of clothes. And, you know, that was time to get all this done, you know, because if I didn't do it at that particular time, I would get behind and it would take me a while to get caught back up. You know, I didn't want to have to look at those dishes in the morning. Well, he asked me one night, he was watching TV. We lived in a little trailer. He was watching TV and he says, come and lay down here next to me and you know, watch TV with me, you know. And I looked at the dishes. I looked at the stuff, you know, I still had to do. I was tired. And I said, well, you know, I need, I got to get this done, baby. You know, I, I just need to get this done. So he didn't say anything. About three different times within the week or two, he asked me, just come lay down there, you know, lay down by, with me by here on the couch, you know, just snuggle up, you know. And I was too busy. And after about the third time, he quit asking me. And then it hurt my feelings. Because I thought, why did he quit asking me? You know, I didn't get this, you know. Why has he stopped? And he just backed off, you know. But that was so important to him. I realized years later, you know, how important that was to him. Just to have that intimate moment. Just to snuggle and just be close to each other, you know. Because he was tired, too. He was working hard. You know, we was both working hard. He worked two jobs for a long time and stuff. But he needed that. And I didn't realize it. I just did not realize it. So I mentioned that sometimes when I talk to women. If your husband needs that intimate snuggle time, like you say, sit on the couch, talk to him, you know, let the dishes go, let some things go. And spend that time with him, you know, because he, they need, you need it. He needs it. You need it, you know. And, um, but that is so intimacy is not just all about sexual. It is about that hug. It is about holding that hand, you know. And I notice a lot of younger couples these days, they don't even hold hands when they're walking together, you know, like we used to. We would hold hands, you know, almost everywhere we went. And they don't do that anymore. They don't hold hands. They don't have that trust or that connection. You know, most couples don't anymore. And I think it's so sad. And with the bucket seats, you know, too, you're separate. Because <laughs> we used to have cars that had the whole seat, you know. <laughs> so you could snuggle up to him and he could put his arm around you and you could, you know, get close to him. And I thought that was great, you know. But that's so true. Thank you for being honest about that because, that is very true. Intimacy is much more than anything sexual. And I think a lot of couples don't realize that. And I didn't realize that as a young wife back then, too, how important that was to him. And, and my reaction when he quit asking me, because it kind of disappointed me and hurt my feelings. But I was the one that, that, that rejected it, you know, not him. But just need to recognize that in men, that they do definitely need that time. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sue. That is, again, Sue, all this stuff, y'all, this is this, this is important stuff. You know, learning these lessons from, from people like Sue and, you know, whoever else. It's super important. So thank you for, thank y'all for being bold and sharing. Thank you.
I, I have something to share, Sean. And Go it ahead. has to do it has to do with relationship. Um in particular, of course, Craig and I, and something that I feel like that has developed recently. Um, and that is, of course, women are more emotional and men are fixers. You know, they wanna they wanna make, you know, they wanna make everything better by fixing whatever problem it is. And but um something that and I actually learned it from my daughter in her marriage and and I actually watched it in action just last week something happened and I'm just going to use their situation for a moment something happened and he didn't watch the kids close enough nothing bad happened but it almost did and she looked at him and she said okay I, I you know the kids were they were out of earshot and she said I just need to tell you right now I'm I'm not happy with you I'm upset with you and she went to express why she was upset with him and he did not react defensively he didn't um he he just really you know loved her even when you know he, he gave her space and let her vent or however you want to say it she needed to express that instead of keeping it bottled up but he responded in love to her and the way it's happened in the past not even just with Craig but in, in relationships when one and it, this could be either person doing it I'm just saying it as the woman at this point but it could be either person the one is expressing their disappointment or what they're upset about, but they, they just need a minute to get those emotions out and allow them to, um, to be expressed instead of uh, burying them and just, you know, I'll just deal with it or whatever because they don't want to have an argument or something, but they're able, if, if we can do that for each other, even but in in our case it's mostly me because I'm so vocal but um but if I can just have a moment to deal with my emotions it's not even that I expect Craig to fix it or anything I just need to work through it and sometimes it happens with him he's this you know it happens with him too but sometimes we just need to work through our emotions we just need a minute to deal with life and once that has taken place, then you can move on and you've not buried it so that it's going to, you know, fester and blow up later. And I think that's a little bit uh, was mentioned earlier. You know, you push things down and sooner or later it's going to, you know, fester and blow up. But uh, but anyways, I just wanted to add that to the relationship thing because and that's kind of may have a negative connotation for a minute while you're expressing those things or working through your emotions. Um, but my daughter says what she says, just give me a minute to get over myself. That's what she says. <laughs> just give me a minute to get over myself. She just needs to express it. And so I've kind of, uh, you know, of course she's full you know, she's an adult, a mother of four and all of that. So she's got a lot going on in her life. But I thought, wow, that is that is really such a, a, a good way to deal with life circumstances. Things things are going to happen. You're not always going to get along. There's you know, you're going to upset one another on occasion. But it needs to be OK to get those to allow the other person to get those emotions out and work through them in themselves so that they can be, you know, that they can move on in a healthy relationship. Amen. Amen. That's good. You know, I'm, I'm guessing that they probably established some ground rules in the beginning of their relationship. And that's a, that's a good thing too, you know, code words and stuff like that. Hey, when I'm mad and I'm, 
the squirrel is running around. Okay, that means that you might need to let it go for just a minute. You know, I, I think that that's that's healthy for sure. I, I can tell you right now, I have not figured that out. So, well, I don't think we have a code word or anything. Yeah. But, but but Craig has learned, I guess maybe he maybe he can see that look in my eye or something. But when I when those things start happening, he had he he will truly be silent instead of saying I didn't say anything but but he really he he's doing that for me and I really appreciate that I just I want him to know that I appreciate him doing that for me and it is um uh, helping us get along better overall um and I want to do that for him too just to say it's not just the one way it's not just one person does that but it in my vision, what I see happening in the world, women typically are more emotional and they're more verbal about that. And a lot of times that's all we need. We just need to be able to let those emotions out so that we can deal with them in ourself. Not that we need to be fixed or that, you know, sometimes, you know, once it's already happened, you can't really change what has happened except for the future ref as a future reference but but anyways just allowing in particular i'm just going to say me or or females but particularly us we really need that um, space to let those emotions out so that we can deal with them in ourselves. I, I think that's probably a two-way street you know, I think that men have to have that kind of short term outlet as well, you know, whether it be going out to split wood or whatever. I mean, whatever the man's outlet is as well, you have to give them a little bit of space to kind of let the let the steam off before you come back to that, you know. Greg, go ahead and uh, package up just a little bit of sliver and send it my way, if you will. <laughs> You know, Sean, you know, you're right. And we know what she said is, is exactly right, too. And as and, and men, too, but women, too, we often we need to understand that. Yes, we can't always fix the problem, but be that it's sometimes it is just that it's this event. And what you may look at as something that is minuscule and is not that important your spouse may look at it as a big deal and they just need to vocalize that. And, you know, my granddad, you know, the man that was my granddad used to always say, never miss, a, never miss the opportunity to shut up and go ahead and laugh, Sean. I know you're going to, but he always say, you got two eyes, two ears and one mouth. You need to see and hear twice as much as what you say. And for, hey, for me, for me, somebody who struggles with anger, and the only way that I know how to fix a problem is with violence. Whether it's with a 20 pound sledgehammer beating something apart or with a chainsaw or with a fist or whatever it is, it's hard in situations to have that balance when there is a conversation or an argument or and, and for me, and I, I encourage any of you, anybody that's listened to this that has got a anger issue or struggles with blowing a gasket or blowing an O-ring in a conversation, you know when that's coming. Whether it your eye starts twitching or the vein in your neck starts throbbing or your finger starts twitching, when you get to that point, walk away from your loved ones. Walk away. And if your loved one turns around and walks away from you in the middle of an argument or a conversation or whatever, don't follow them. Because when, when you make that step to follow them and try to stop them, that is when you're, that's when it's going to go from a civil conversation and the devil's going to put his foot in the door and he's going to kick it wide open and knock it off the hinges and it's going to be bad. And, you know, Shannon, Shannon gave us a bunch of these bracelets at work. I know, Sean, you've got one, but it's Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And two of the most important things on this that I look at every day is the word patience 
and self-control. And I, I think I've had this thing on my wrist for about four months. I, I had taken it off. Because, yes, you're right. We need to vent. We need to talk about those problems. But at the same time, we have to remember that sometimes we don't need to say anything back. Sometimes we need to allow your wife or your husband or even your kids, as hard as it is as a parent, when your kid has a problem, maybe you just need to let them talk and not try to fix it and not try to tell them what to do better. Just let them talk and let them vent. And most of the time, we'll probably figure out on our own what the, the issue was and that we can move forward from that point. And in that same conversation with your loved ones, if there is an issue or a, a spur under the saddle, I mean, I, I grew up on a farm around horses, so if there's a burr under the saddle for something and you keep running into that problem and you keep irritating your spouse or irritating your loved one, whoever that may be, then in that same conversation, you need to say, how do I fix this? You need to ask that question verbally. How can I fix this? What can I do to do to be better and what can I do to make this situation better so we don't keep having the same problem? And roll your feelings up, tuck them up under your arm, because get ready, you may get your feelings hurt. And, you know, it, it may be not what you want to hear, but that's what your spouse needs for you to do to be there to help them. And it, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, I mean... It, with with anger and anger is the devil working they they want the devil wants you to be mad at your wife and you know you hear it all the time you know sean talked about it a while ago with the attack on the nucleus of the family and what you know the world views as a nuclear family with a father and a mother present and it's hard to, you know, just speaking from my life experience, at some point you have to break the generational curse of your family, whatever it is. And in our family, there was one way and one way only that a problem was dealt with, and that was with violence. It didn't matter what you did. It was physical punishment because the theory was if it hurts, you won't do it again. And if you're not going to learn, then you'll be tough. And that's the hardest thing for me because I didn't know any other way to correct a problem other than with violence. Now I mean, the baby is seven. So it's violence was always there for whatever it was. And you have to learn that there's other options to put forward in, in teaching and training and correcting. And that sometimes violence is the only, a violent response is the only answer. You know, when, when someone attacks your family, Hey, that's where the line draws. Violence is the only response that you have for that. But when, when your children, I mean, the Lord did not see fit to bless me with boys. He blessed me with two little girls because I needed my heart softened. And any of you that have got girls, you know that they will soften your heart if you're a man. And sometimes I have to remember that as a father and a leader, hey, they're little girls. And they're going to look at things different than you do. And you have to open your heart. And, you know, they want to help dad. But, you know, we're, this is not really something little girls do, quote unquote. But they're going to be there. And they're going to see you in the way that you treat your wife and the way that you treat them and learn that this is how a woman's supposed to be treated. And what I looking at this bracelet, you know, goodness it says goodness. I try to think of, Hey, am, am the person that I'm being, do I want them to marry my daughter? Do I want my daughter to marry that person? And 15, 20 years ago, I mean, Sean knows me. If 
me 20 years ago came to my front door to take my daughter out on a date, I'd bury him in the backyard with a backhoe. It's not happening. And it's a struggle that we face every day. And we've got to learn that that fixing and communicating part is sometimes we just need to remember, let them vent. Just like she said, I need to tell you this. I need to get my feelings out for you to understand what the problem is. And maybe from that point, it's just, that's all, that's all we need to hear. Yep. But if it's a recurring problem and you're know, just like Miss Sue said, if as a husband or as a wife, you start noticing things that your spouse is not doing or not saying or not asking you anymore, there's probably a reason why. And it's because they got tired of beating their head against the wall and they're just not interested in it anymore. And when we can break that bound, our relationship is going to grow tenfold. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good word. Wisdom, bro. Go ahead, Rebecca. No, I wanted to add that, um, you know, talking about the emotional side of the, you know, I know we we're talking about the emotional side of the woman. And I think even what my brother Michael was talking about earlier about the need for a man to, uh, to experience intimacy with his wife. And I just wanted to say, you know, with, from a woman's side of the spectrum, right. With, you know, with the versus the man's need is, uh, one of the biggest needs of a wife is to be, is to be secure, right? But not just secure, like provision wise, but there's an emotional security that a woman needs from her husband, right? And a lot of times, I think one of the struggles with, with men is uh, um, even though they, they might hear, but they, sometimes they don't understand the emotion or sometimes they might not have the patience, like kind of like what uh, my sister was saying earlier about her daughter being able to express her emotions to her husband. Um, there's a there's a difference between being heard and being understood. And I think for a woman, when she does not feel understood, it almost like uh, there's a security there that they need from that understanding from the husband. And the thing is, it, it does affect um the intimacy, the intimacy side of it, because here's the thing for a woman, right? I can't speak for all women because I know <laughs> some women, uh, they probably don't even need that. But most women, the intimate side of a woman is you need that security. Like uh, for a woman to surrender herself intimately to, to her husband, there has to be that security, that um, knowing that there's a connection emotional there. And a lot of times with men, um, they, they don't have the patience to truly understand the emotions of a woman and they kind of just bypass it or sometimes they don't want to deal with it. It's too much for them. And they might just kind of hear but not really put their heart into it. And then when it comes to like sharing intimacy, not just sexually, just any type of intimacy, it can be mostly physical intimacy. When you're trying to share that physical intimacy with, with your wife, sometimes you don't feel it or you're not getting the response from her. It's because the emotional security is not there. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of times men miss that point because they don't see the, they don't see the, 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 it's almost like a lot of men don't have the, the, patience. I guess you could say, yeah, the patience to really understand the woman. They don't see like, this is important. And then when it comes to the intimacy side, they feel that rejection from the wife. And it's not that they want to reject, it's just for the wife to surrender intimately to the husband there has to be security there's not something that we can just do you know it's, it's not like a wife is a a, a a you say a professional you know person that just gives herself to anybody <laughs> you know what I'm so i'm just saying in general like it increases intimacy increases when the husband takes time to understand the emotional side of the wife it's not just about providing it's not just about giving her hugs it's not just about that. It's really a lot of it with a woman. A woman functions emotionally. The emotions of a woman, there's a security need there that needs to, to, to happen with the woman so she can feel connected to her husband in a security way where she easily surrenders to him intimately. So a lot of it has to do with the, I guess, with the husband. And it, and it all takes love because at the same time as the, the husband is getting love from, from Christ, he's learning how to be more gentle. 
He's learning how to be more uh, patient with the wife. And the emotional side is very important for the wife. And I just wanted to add that because it's a huge need that is bypassed so much. Um, and, and it does affect intimacy. And then you have the lacking of both sides. The woman is not understood and a man is not getting the, the physical need that he needs, you know? Um, and that's something I wanted to just throw in. <laughs> How oh, I had, I had oh. one. Um, I think somebody was saying about um, the patient. So I had did a, a marriage ceremony a couple months ago. And one of the, for the ring ceremony, I had put a, I wrote my own uh, little script for them. And it was saying, I, whoever the name is, promise to exercise my love by being patient with kindness and not being jealous or boastful or proud or rude. My love will not demand its own way. It will not <clears throat> be irritable and it will never keep record of, of being wrong. It will not rejoice about justice or rejoice when the truth wins out. Under any circumstance, my love will never give up nor lose its faith. It will always be hopeful and endure through everything life brings for at us. So that's like one of the things I try to to practice too, you know, to to practice that same thing in a marriage, you know. But Rebecca, like, try to be the patience, try to be the loving, even though don't worry about, you know, sometimes when we get into a fight, we want to be like, oh, who's right or who's wrong? No, let's rejoice on who's, what the truth is, you know? What does God say about this, you know? And the only reason why we're just sharing is in the beginning of our marriage, we had learned a lot because he was, um, in the be and just, you know, just sharing for edification purpose, um, He's always been a nice guy. He's always been a very, and I've always been kind of a little bit on the strong-willed side, but he was always in, with his, like, locked up in his emotions because of, uh, you know, stuff that he went through. And so a lot of times I'm a communicator, so I will say, hey, what are you thinking about what you're doing? And he'll be like, nothing. So it was almost like we'll talk about things, but we wouldn't get too um, intimate as far as, like, talking about things. And then, like, for example, when it came to, like, intimacy time, it was more like, I, I, I couldn't connect with him because my um, there was no security uh, emotionally, you know what I'm saying? Or like if I start um, sharing with him how I felt, it was more like a defensive response instead of understanding my emotion. And I know it's hard because sometimes women, we can come off like we're criticizing, but we're not really criticizing. We're just expressing the need that we have. Like, I need you. They're trying to say, I need you, in this area. but they're looking at it as, okay, you're finding fault in me. And you're criticizing this about me. So the defensive side comes up. And the thing is that when the defensive side comes up, it's almost like you're telling that emotional need of you're wrong. And, you know, so it's almost like it doesn't get anywhere. So then it affects what I'm just trying to say. It ends up affecting the very need that the man has from the wife, which is the uh, that intimacy doesn't just happen because you're attracted to each other. May it might in the beginning, but the 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 intimacy starts connecting when the emotions are understood because the, the woman needs that security from the husband that she's understood emotionally. So that's, that's where it's hard. Uh, you need Christ because either way it could be, and I know the wife can really work on the way she delivers a message. I know that much because you, sh you should. And then this is one thing that I did want to add. It's okay for the wife to express her emotions, but she has to do it in a way that honors, that honors the husband at the same time, you know, saying you can't, express your emotion putting down your husband either you know and that's something that um is super important especially if you want your emotions to get received right <laughs> you know what I'm saying? you can't start calling them names and start like you know screaming at them and expect them to just be you know um but what i'm just saying is that that affects and then you know when we, after in our a couple of years in our marriage when we realized that and that's where we started working on it and we started experiencing what we really wanted from each other you know and that's where that's where everything's, you know, so this is something that we wanted to share is a super, super important is that security for the woman emotionally is, is very, very important. And that it takes time. It takes an investment of time to listen to her when you don't feel like talking to her, you know, or like, you know, just seeing what she's carrying, what burden she's carrying or, you know, any of those things. But yeah.
y'all got to forgive me for this big old cheese eating grin that I got on my face. But y'all got me fired up. <laughs> so uh, one thing that I've heard over and over and over again out of 43 years of living is women say that they are the most emotional out of the two sexes, men and women. Let me correct y'all. Let me correct y'all. So am I right in saying that woman was taken from man, <laughs> from the rib, right? So I guess that rib contained all the emotion that the man had. <laughs> it just wiped us clean. It gave y'all all the emotions that we just sticks in the mud and we don't feel nothing. So it's uh, it's funny if you think about it, but if you really think about it, society equals Satan. And when you get down to the point, everything in society, if it's not coming out the word of God, is from Satan. It is 1,000% propaganda that he has started from way back at Adam and Eve days and has grown until now. So what's expected of a young man that is becoming a man? You know, provide protection. And that's drilled in your head. Provide for your wife. They'll show you scriptures that tells you how a husband is supposed to uh, provide for his wife. They'll beat in your head protection. Every man's got a pistol. Every man's got a dog. Every man's going to protect that home at any cost because he loves his wife and he loves his kid. They don't go back and tell you that men also have emotions. Rage is an emotion. Anger is an emotion. All these things are emotions that are equal to the women's emotions. But we're taught to bottle it up, put it deep in that back, and don't even think about it until, guess what? Like, take a soda and shake that joker up and let it fizz and then take off the top. Pop! It's going to blow up. Now he's in the wrong because he's handled everything wrong. I am him. And I'll just give you a short testimony. I work with Mike and me and Sean and Sam. We pray every morning. And I had to come to uh, the morning prayer and basically confess. Everybody knows Shannon. I've been this guy that has smiled and laughed and just cared about everybody forever. And I've not had to deal with anger. Anger's never been like a thing that I've had to worry about. Well, started last Monday, little bitty chips at my just inner being. Chips, chips, the guys that I work with. Shannon, that ain't going to work. Shannon, this ain't going to work. And it just started aggravating me. Into the rest of the week, it was a little bit of chips. And I think Mike was at Thursday. We was working on that tool, the toolbox. So Thursday comes along after four days of all this just chipping, chipping away. And somebody shook that bottle. <laughs> ha! And the top blew off. I took my gloves off like a little two-year-old kid. I threw them on the back of the truck. I said, y'all know what? Y'all can fix it. I don't care. I would have sacked my truck, puffed up, and pissed off for about 30 minutes. <laughs> So it's just, <laughs> I'm not accustomed to that because that's not a part of my character. But under stress, and everybody knows I got stress on my shoulders and all this, there was an open door that the devil creeped in and he got me. That's, I can't say it no other way, he got me. So now I'm starting to realize that I have emotions that spring up that I have to start dealing with. I have to start learning how to deal with because I'm normal. Um, don't get upset and angry and all this good stuff, but Shannon don't know how to handle this. So I got brothers like Sam. I got brothers like Sean, Mike. Mike come and talk to me because he's got angel problems and everybody's like mentoring me. And I'm like, okay, I got it. Round two. Let's go. All right. So going back to the emotional thing, ladies, we like everything that y'all like. We feel every single thing that y'all feel. We just don't show it because we have been bred, raised, and I'm telling you, brainwashed not to. So when you take a good woman, as all of y'all are, and you take this good man that's been brainwashed, it takes time to get him in that proper way of being able to communicate and to share his emotions the correct way. All right, so Sean hit on something and it just spoke life into me. So I am a welder by trade. Well, several trades. So Sean hit on the welding. In welding, 
you got two pieces of metal and you, you take electricity and you take a rod and you put these two pieces of metal together and they become one. Well, if the metal's thick, that's what thin stuff. If the metal, two thick pieces of metal, and what spoke to me in that, two people with baggage. So what I mean by baggage, you got children, you got uh, ex-husband, ex-wives, you got history. So a lot of us come from broken homes, and now we're walking in the faith, and we're trying to start over. So when Sean spoke that welder, it just started oh, feeding into my brain. You got these two thick pieces of metal, but you just can't weld them like you do thin pieces of metal. You have to do a thing called a root pass. So a root pass is you turn that electricity wide open. You get it hot, hot as you can, and you sit there and you hold it. And what you're doing, you're breaking down the materials of both pieces of metal. You're basically melting them. And as they melt, they come in, and as you've got this rod and you're running down through it, it all melts and becomes one piece. Guess what? In this root pass, it's ugly. It ain't no stacked dimes, as we say in the trade. It ain't no pretty where you're going to show your friends, take pictures. It is ugly. But let me tell you what it is. It's unbreakable. There's a test that they give you where you run that root pass, and they try to bend this metal. And if it goes under so many thousand, thousands of pounds of pressure, it won't break. If it breaks, then you fail. So it's ugly. But after you get the root pass, you come back, you grind it all the way out down to the bottom, and you run your pretty passes. And now it's a beautiful piece of metal that becomes one. We are one flesh before we are asked to become one flesh. If women come from the rib, that means we started out as one. So if you have that thought process, woman comes from me, then I in turn accept her back to me. What does that come along with? Submission. Submission. This is one thing men struggle with is submitting to their wife. If you can't submit to God, you're not going to submit to your wife. If you can't submit to God, you're not going to submit to your boss. Submission is a one focus, got the blinders on one way direction. It ain't no plan B, plan A, all this good stuff. It's a one way track. Submission to God, submission to all the things like Andrew spoke about tonight. Being a husband, a father, a friend, those three things right there, that's three different different dynamics of a man's life that are just, man, wow, because every man on here, I guarantee you, has a buddy that they love to death that is not walking the same walk that we're attempting to walk. <laughs> when they come to you and they remember you of the past and they say, hey, man, I know you don't drink anymore, but, but do you want to come watch the game with us? No, I don't want to come watch the game with you because I remember how drunk it was. <laughs> you know, you have to tell your friends that. And you have to have a separation, that supplemental separation between that friend and your new lifestyle. Well, that comes in the submission. You're submission, uh, submitting to God's will, not to your own. Because there's a ton of things that we want to do that we shouldn't do because it's not in God's will for our life. So going back to the emotions thing, if we can understand that society has made us into something that God did not intend us to be, that's the starting point of learning how to be a new creation. Letting the Holy Spirit actually abide in your heart and change you into what God created you to be. Even in church, you hear sermons, you hear teachings. It's about the king, the warrior. Man, I guarantee you can go on YouTube and pull up uh, manhood, and I guarantee you the first thing that's going to pop off is a hundred uh, videos of people preaching about the warrior and the king. Well, they don't tell you about the friend and the lover that the man is also supposed to be. They don't tell you that man is also a nurturer. Women nurture in a way physically, but men are supposed to nurture spiritually. It's the same thing. It's two different aspects and two different sides of it. So, you know, it. I was laughing about it, but it really hits me deep because I've been in the marriage scene. I didn't do the right things because I wasn't walk, walking in the way. And now I'm back in the single scene. To be single and trying to live this life and to try to seek out a wife is something that's very hard to do. Because now I'm trying to de-brainwash myself from all the structure that society has given me. I'm trying to walk in the will of God and not my own. I'm trying to do all these things, but at the same time, still look for that woman that is walking in that same way. And there's a lot of clashing in that. Everything everybody said on here was just 
hammer it on the nail, dead on the head. It was correct. There's just different sides from it from every point of view. You've got the divorcees. You got you got the single people that never been married. You got the happily ever after been married thirty something years to the same person. You got so many different dynamics, but it really starts off at the foundation. What? When are we affected? Men, I can speak for us, is when you're 15, 14, however early you start, what's the first thing that's thrown in your face? A woman in a seductive way. Your buddies, hey, have you kissed a girl yet? Hey, have you did all this? That's Satan trying to push you into that society realm. If you ain't kissed a girl by this age, then you're behind the power curve. If you ain't slept with a woman or this many women, then you're not in the going crowd. So you, the devil starts on us early. Women, you're pressured by us because the devil's pressuring, pressuring us. So we now listen to all this crap that society puts in our head, and we come to that woman of God that's 16, 17, and is minding her own business. Now we're putting the pressure on you to make you do things that you know you shouldn't be doing. So where does it start? It starts with man. Same thing in the home. Men go out, like Mike said, and that was a good point. We walk out that door, and now we got a battle. We fight. From the second we walk out of our out of door, especially if you're married, because guess what? It's separation from your covering, which is the wife. So now you're out there battling everything in this spiritual realm that Satan has set up to destroy you, because if he destroys you, he destroys your home. So you're out there battling when you come home, I can tell y'all this was a thorn in my past marriage. I'd come home beat down from working, uh, dirty, tired, because I'd given my all, wasn't in the will of God, wasn't trying to seek his face. So my mind is all crazy. When I walk in that door, all I wanted was my wife to acknowledge that I had worked hard for her. And I never got it. It was the grass was too tall. I needed to cut the grass. Man, I done work 18 hours a day. I ain't worried about no grass. So my mouth, would go back against her mouth, and guess what? It was back and forth, back and forth. No communication whatsoever. But it's just like Mike said, and I, I felt that. I just wanted a simple pat on the back or a simple just touch, hit me on the butt or something. Hey, good job, baby, good game, something. But it was never that. So Mike hit that. Man, I'm telling you, you hit me deep in my heart because now I know from the history of what I didn't do, now I know when I come in the house if I don't get it, I can start it. And that's what men don't do. We get all puffed up and mad and because we don't get it. And we'll go off in our room or we'll go in the shop with the dog or whatever, and we ain't going to say nothing to nobody until we shake up that soda and pop that lid. Men, if we ain't getting it, them women are busy. Those women have things going on. They have attacks of the enemy the same. We can pop her on the butt. Hey, babe, how you doing? Blah, 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 and get it started and push her into that feeling of what we need, and then we share it together. So it's a two-way street. I don't care how you look at it. We've said this through the prior teachings, that women come from our side to be beside of us. Uh, Melissa made a good point on the uh, Ezer, I think was the word, as the help me. We're equal. They walk. They're, they're covering an intercessory prayer. They're, we are together in that one flesh, but we have to remember that we come from one flesh. So we cannot continue to let society Satan derail us from our true and natural calling. Men have to go out and seek God's face every second of the day. Bottom line, before you go to work, before you take care of the kids, before you kiss your wife on the forehead, you need to be on your knees consulting your daddy. First and foremost, Sean taught me this. Sean said, every morning I get up, I go in my closet. This is something that we have to do as men. We have to go to daddy first. Women, your first move out of the bed is to pray for that man. If there's not a man, go to the daddy. This is how it needs to be. Everything else will fall in place if we start doing that first. And that's just real talk. And that's all I got for tonight. I just want y'all to know that we're emotional too. We cry. Y'all just don't see it. We we feel things. <laughs> we could write books. I don't know who buy them. But we, <laughs> I'm done. Shannon, you brought up the emotion part, but I'm going to bring it back to creation and and put it on the simplicity side. Man was made from dirt and dust. So 
women came from the rib of man. So I, I've always understood it like this. Man had the simplicity of dirt and women have the complexity of coming out of a created body as Adam's rib. And I'm not even going to go trying to tie that to emotions. I've just always, you brought up the rib part and I was like, yeah, men really do follow the simplicity rule of dirt. And, and, and I'm real at ease in dirt, but uh, I leave the complexity part or I try to, because I don't know anybody. I don't know any man who does well dealing with the complexity of women. It's, it's beyond all of us for all the women to hear. It's a straight up admission. It's just beyond us. <laughs> Craig, you do know you just gave these women firepower against us when they could say, well, God said it, you dumb as dirt. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Craig. We appreciate that. I appreciate Amen. that. Hallelujah. Leave me out of the leave me out of the hard stuff. <laughs> I, I I do want to say something that um I forgot that I was gonna say. Um mothers, also fathers, um what greater love can be shown than a small boy in his mother's lap? There ain't no greater love than that small boy, that young man before he reached that age where the devil starts drilling in that mind in his mother's bosom. So you're talking about emotion, that child will cry to mama, that child would come up to mama and just out of nowhere, mama, I love you. I'm talking about all the emotions that you could ever think about come from that boy and his mama. Well, that boy didn't die, that boy's still in there. It just gets covered up with all this crap. So, you know, it says what, twice a try, a uh, child wants a man, because when we get old, we're going to go back to our mama's wife in our butts and all that good stuff. But real talk, we are sensitive. We're sensitive. We have emotions. We love the same things because it displays in the child boy to the mother. Because I know I love my mom. I'm telling she couldn't go. I would hold on to her leg and she have to drag my big head all around the store because I didn't want to turn loose my mom. Well, that has been a thing going into my adulthood because in my brain, I wanted to find that woman that was as close as I could possibly get to my mama because it was a mess. And when I moved out, I moved out too soon. I got in a live scene too soon and it left a hole in my heart. So when I start looking for women, the women had to be equal to what I knew of my mom to be because that's what I was used to. And that's a whole nother subject that you can sit there and talk about. And I'm not going into it, but we are emotional beings. And it's proof if you women have boys then y'all should see that every day we ain't changed we just got old and gray we the same kids amen anybody else i honestly would say that speaking from self more so than trying to lay anything else on anybody else um, I think men are at, actually at the point of the inexperience with emotions so when we're faced with them we don't really know what to do with them because from an early from an early age we were encouraged to uh, to pile to, to bottle it up and, and and then, you know, it basically we're recommended to use Pandora's box and that always has a terrible outcome. But later on, now we're literally at that same age, seven to nine years old, when we stopped using the emotions or we bottled them up, now we tap back into them in our, you know, 40s, 50s, whatever. and we don't have the experience and we really don't know what to do with them. So we're, we're sifting through that process and working on getting caught back up. And honestly, it takes Jesus to guide us and navigate us on that path. So 
it's uh, it it's kind of it displaces us but anybody who's dealt with unforgiveness will also understand that their triggers will always throw them back to the age where unforgiveness was entered into the life so if if you had an aunt at 10 years old you'll find you stop maturing at 10 years old until forgiveness comes back in maturing does the maturing process is stunted so in the same thing it's the same rule it still applies both ways but i just wanted to kind of share touch on the subject amen because you just about opened up the box thanks we'll, we'll put that lid on for safekeeping for another time <laughs> Because that's a whole long session we could go into that, brother. And that would be a good one, too. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to write that in. Go ahead, Dustin. I know you was you was being patient. Can you hear me okay? That may have thumbs on. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. So, so many different things um, that so many of you have said has has hit home so hard tonight. Michael, man, you have spoke my heart. <laughs> um, Rebecca, you spoke things. Shannon, bro, you... let, me, let me turn these things off. If it'll, if it'll help. Is that any better? Okay. So, you know, talking about the emotions of a man and a woman and stuff like that, something that I've learned in my personal and my relationship with Heather is, yes, men, men are, are sensitive. And so I guess I can, I can liken myself to a dog. I mean, that's, that's plain and simple. But, and the, way, the, the reason I say that is because if I come in the house and my wife comes and, and, and pats me on the head, just like she would a dog, you know, come here, come, c come on over here. You know, I, I'd, be, <laughs> I'd, I'd be there just like that, just to have her. And I know it's humorous. Y'all I mean, I kind of mean for it to be, but at the same time, I, I need that attaboy. I need somebody to say, good job. What you're doing, it's working. What you're doing, I appreciate. And, and what I say when a man is sensitive, He's sensitive in, in this manner. And this, this, I heard this the other day. It, it spoke to me tremendously because as they giver, I need, the giver is totally dependent upon the recipient because the re recipient has to validate what is being given. And when she validates what is being given, then, then I'm pushed to do even more to give even when I don't want to give when, when it's hard to listen, when it's hard to understand when she receives what I've given and she turns it into so much more and it validates what I've given. It, it just makes our relationship work so much better that, that intimate time, not, not talking about just the nasty I'm talking about, just, just that time, like Miss Sue said, you know, come, come lay down on the couch with me, or, or some of the best times that me and my wife have had, yo. I've sat down on one end of the couch, and she's on the other end, and I've got two feet in my lap, and I'm rubbing them feet. It just feels good to be in the presence of each other when she knows that what you're given is intentional. That you're not just doing it just to get what the happy is at the end of the night. And yo, we all want that. Men and women alike, we crave that type of intimacy. But when I give, and I give completely, when Jesus said, give yourselves to your wife as Christ has given himself to the church, Jesus didn't look at that cross and say, yo, that's where I'm hanging out tonight. You coming or not? He looked at that cross and he even asked and said, let this cup pass from me. But if it's your will, and I'm not, I'm not liking crucifixion to marriage. I'm not trying to do that at all. I'm just saying that when we give ourselves as men completely 
to our wives when we don't feel like it, when we're frustrated. When we do that and she validates what we give, it, it just makes our relationship go so much better. Amen, amen. Let's see, somebody... Raphael says in John 17, 21, that they may also be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. They are also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. In us equals the reduction of selfish individual perspectives. We must value each other and esteem the other greater, more important than the other. Yes, Raphael, thank you very much. Amen. Amen. But when I've when been teaching about the power of prayer and why, one of the things I say is men need confirmation and a men need affirmation. Affirmation is like emotional and confirmation is like stating a fact that the man's doing a good job or being there. And that's what I, it's, it's, it's like when it comes together and it's like brings unity to them when you understand that what your man needs is confirmation and when he understands that as a wife you need affirmation oh somebody else talking Yeah, I don't, we're not getting any of it, sis. It's all breaking up. We did get the part that you said that uh, confirmation and affirmation for sure. All right. Renee, did you have something you wanted to share? Hi, good evening, everyone. Hello. Hello. Um, I just like to uh, share that um, I don't know if I'm really saying this the way um, it should be said, but I just really. Renee, did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, you can't hear me. Sean, you nobody can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. OK, um, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, um, but I, it's just on my heart to say this. Um, I'm really grateful for each and every one that had something to say according to the way wives and husbands and fathers should act. Um, my spirit, as I was listening and I got up to, to go um, walk away, I had to come back and, and think for a minute. When God first created the earth, he started out as it was said with Adam from Rebecca's husband. You know, even though I'm hoping I'm saying this right because God also has emotions, you know. Um, God wanted Adam to have a helpmate, He wanted him to have a wife. Uh, he didn't want him to bear life by himself with just trees and fruits and things of the earth. He wanted someone that he could socialize with, someone that he can be with someone that they can grow together. So that's how I look at a marriage. In the beginning, you know, I think I was saying it last week, last, you know, or the week before when I brought up the situation about Lavelle and I and, and me being married and not being a wife or not knowing how to be a wife at that time. Um, marriage is, is really sacred. And marriage is really strong and it takes a lot, not only from the man, but it takes a lot from the wife because each and every day you're in a marriage, you got to remember that you grow from age. Each You're not, you're not going to stay the same age. You might start being married at 20, but then you're going to be 21, 22. You're going to, your age is going to change. So your mentality, your mindset, your life is going to change. So 
you know, um, there's a lot that is intolerance, just like the Lord. You have to tolerate a lot. So like Shannon was saying, male and female have emotions. But I do want to say that women are stricken with a lot of things because she wants to be loved strongly by a man. And the man seems to have more strength mentally when it comes to loving a woman. And I say that because um, also Shannon said something about his last relationship. And then someone said about bringing garbage um, in the new relationship. So um, it takes a lot from both sides to really just embed and, and, and grasp on to just being a part of each other. It, it, it's really difficult um, when you're first in the world and then you get saved. You know, because sometimes you come in a relationship and you still think in worldly. It takes a lot to turn turn the other cheek to think, oh, now I'm a woman of God and I'm a, or I'm a man of a uh, uh, a man of God. Um, it's just tolerance is is a part of marriage. That's what I want to say. That's what I need to say. Um, you have to tolerate a lot in order for it to 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 last because there, you're going to grow and your mindset is going to be different. That's all I want to say. Tolerance is like a number one thing for me and my marriage. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for sharing. Thank you. What you want to say, boo? My boo want to talk. Uh -huh. <laughs> Come on, boo. What you got to say, baby? I say, us as men, we have a, we have a very strong role as men. And the reason why I say that is, is because I come to recognize that the enemy doesn't like marriage. He yeah. never did. We are married to the, we are married to the bride. We are the bride of Christ. And he's trying to separate us from, from, from our, our, our Lord, Jesus. So what makes he, th what makes you think he ain't going to try to separate us from our wives? And each and every day, I have to be reminded of that that the enemy tries to come to steal, kill, and destroy, and he will use whatever tactic that he can to destroy that marriage. Even at times where, you know, I find how he will play tricks with your mind and make something seem, make it something seem as though it is, but it, it's really not. And it's false things that he will play tricks and, and put illusions in front of you to make you think this, but it's not really what it is. And he and a person can feed on it and it'll cause arguments in your relationship. But we I come to recognize I wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's the spirit that I, I wrestle against. And sometimes, sometimes I can bring those spirits in, or my wife can bring those spirits in from work or whatever. And if we don't recognize them spirits within each other, we're clashing. And I find myself most of the time praying, Lord, you gave me this woman. This is the woman you wanted me to have. Lord, help me because I don't know how to deal with this situation, but you do. I'm not strong in this situation, but through you, I, I, I will be. There's times, you know, where we get we all we both get frustrated and we want to walk away. But with God, all things are possible. And I like this scripture that my wife hit me with this morning. Love is patient, love is kind, love conquers all. Yeah. Love conquers all. And that's through all you guys that were on today speaking. Even uh I think it was Rebecca that spoke. I really enjoyed what you had to say because I'm learning each and every day how to be a better husband, a better man, a better father, a better everything. Because like I told you guys a couple of days ago, majority of my life has been in prison and that's all I knew is how to be a hard dude. That's all I knew. I had to stay, uh, I had to keep a shell on. I had to be hard in a man of, in a place where there's nothing but killers and predators and stuff like that. So I had to keep a shell on and still out here today, I still see, sometimes I still have that and I need to break that and be this gentleman and this loving man that God has created me to be for my wife, my friends, and people around me. 
That's mm -hmm. a, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know, I just before I before I, I I'm sorry. Um, I want to say when I say tolerance, like the devil, the devil is cunning, powerful, and and and, and he wants you to to run away from from what you what God has blessed you with or what God has done in your life from family to friends to your job to to whatever it is that you've encountered since you've been walking with Christ if you come from where I come from and I know that the men here you guys don't know too much about me because when I was in the um when I be came to the encounter, you know, I went straight with the females. I never gave my testimony to the men. So you men don't really know too much about my testimony. You only know what Lavelle has shared with you in the encounter. But I come from a walk of life that took me through a lot of changes and a lot of challenges that I had to succumb. And I had to really gasp, grasp on the whole of the Lord Jesus Christ to have me survive because I was just really raw I, you know, um, I, I, I didn't care about where I was going or what I was doing. I was just out there. And so, um, I had to learn how to not be the Renee that was in the world, but to be the Renee that had submitted and had succumbed to wanting to be a different person and having a different mindset. I'm big on changing different mindsets. As I said, that's really important to me because I read um, the word of God. I study the word of God and I um, I press in, you know, I'm up in the morning and, and I'm reading scriptures because I have to, I have to evolve and I have to know that being with the Lord is, is going to take care of my life. So I had to learn some tolerance. I was one, I didn't know how to tolerate anything. I I, whatever was coming to me, I was, I was bold. I, I I would go up against it. Um, I would fight it, even if it if if it, one thing would trigger me, and I'm going off. I'm just that's it. I'm going off the handle. So um, I had to learn how to just sit still, pray, and accept things. That's more of a better word. Accept the challenges that was coming towards me. So um, I God. had to. Praise God for grace, huh? Amen. Amen. That's, that's sure. what it is. It's grace for sure. For Amen. sure. Amen. I, Amen. I, think, I think one of the biggest things that we could probably summarize up here, I think I'll let Andrew uh, go ahead and finish this out in just a second. It's getting to be about getting kind of late. And I know that we could probably go until one or two o'clock in the morning. But yeah. um, thank you for everyone sharing tonight. Thank you for uh, everybody's input because it's been very, very powerful tonight. And, and, it, and it doesn't come at uh, a cheap cost because a lot of us have had to experience a lot of things and learn some great lessons by that. And thank you all for sharing uh, those things. So um, please keep it coming. But I think one of the, one of the biggest things was like I just told Renee it was you know having grace. But I think a, a big thing is is communication. I, I think if we can get that down. Start communicating. Um, honest communication. Honest and effective communication. And sometimes that means being quiet. And sometimes that means go ahead and. You know, you got to swallow your pride and just, you know, be quiet or um, actually convey what it is that's going on. So um, thank you for a great, great study tonight, Andrew. Uh, you did an amazing job. Um, thank you all for, for sharing tonight. But I'm going to go ahead and let Andrew um, close us out. Do we have any uh, quick prayer requests we can get down and then I'll let Andrew close it out? I think we, we have an overarching prayer request, of course. We, we want to continue. Make sure that you continue to pray for Israel. Um, scripture is very clear about the those who um, bless Israel, the Lord will bless. Um, and if you don't understand biblical prophecy, um, maybe that's another discussion for another day, but um, get ready. And if, and if your families aren't ready, then you need to be doing what you need to do to prepare them. Um, lead them to Christ. Get yourself and being a good example to get them back to Christ um, and start doing those things because the day is quickly approaching. So. There's no prayer requests. Um, John, we have we have one. Um, Sherry, she's not on. She usually comes on on Tuesday nights. Um, her mom has a, a biopsy coming up on her lung, and they're thinking it may be cancerous. So uh, we need to put her on the on the prayer list. And we are actually planning on going. We're trying to schedule it out. Either they're going to come here, or we're going to go there. And we're 
I'm actually going to pray for mom. So we definitely, anybody that wants to be included in that, uh, just hit me and Melissa up. We're going to get that scheduled out so we can go pray for this lady. Okay. Uh, we got Dustin on the list. Uh, Edie's sister had heart surgery. Edie's usually on here on Tuesdays. Okay. Anybody else? I'll ask for prayer for healing for myself. I've had some tooth teeth issues going on lately, and it's very consuming. If anybody's had tooth pains, I know you guys understand how consuming can, it can be, but um, it's been going on for about three weeks now, and I've got more procedures coming up next week, and then I've got uh, oral surgery on Thursday. So just asking for, for prayers, please. Absolutely. Anybody else? All right, Andrew, you, you got them? Sherry, Dustin, Edie, and Melissa. Rebecca, did you write them down or you want me to? You want me to? You want me to? I can do it. You need me to? You got it? He's muted, but I can't tell if he's. It's in the chat, right? Uh, most of them. Uh, um, okay, I'll write them as you're starting to pray. All right. Father God, we just thank you, Lord God. We just thank you that we could come before you, Lord God, and be open, Lord God, with everything that you have given us, Lord God, and be able to edify one another, Lord God. And we thank you that you could be able that we could be able to learn your word and grow from your word today, Father Lord God. And Lord God, today as we close out, Lord God, just be with us, Lord God. And Lord God, we just bring our prayer requests to you, Lord God, to a throne room, Father Lord God. We lift up um 80 sisters lord god for the for her heart, heart surgery lord god we just pray that your your spirit will be with her lord god that her healing will be her speedy recovery father lord god and we pray that you will guide those surgeons lord god and every everything that they need to do lord god and we just pray that you put a hedge of protection upon her lord god and upon her life right now lord god and Lord God, we just lift up Dustin, Lord God, that you remember him, Lord God, to be able to get an assignment closer to home, Lord God, where he could be with his family, Father, Lord God. And we just pray that your will be done in his life, Lord God, that he'll, whatever plan that you have for him, Lord God, that you'll be able to open those doors for him, Father, Lord God, and close the doors that needs to be closed, Father, Lord God. And we thank you for what you're going to do with Dustin's, Father, Lord God. As he, as he walked the path that you have for him, Father God. And we thank you, Lord God. We even lift up um, Sherry, Lord God, for her uh, mom's biopsy, for her lungs, Lord God, that you will, that you will guide that, the, the doctors, Lord God, on everything that they have to do, Lord God, to be able to guide them on this uh, biopsy, Lord God. We just pray that your miracles hands will touch her right now in the name of Jesus, Father Lord God, that it will be that it will be a quick, quick healing, Lord God, a quick recovery, Lord God. We just pray for any discomfort, Lord God, that you'll be able to guide her and give her that that comfort, Lord God, that you give each and every one of us, Father God. And we just pray for Melissa, Lord God, even for that toothache, the tooth pain, Lord God. That you'll be the comfort, Lord God. That you'll be her, her, um, her healer, Father God. Even as she goes through the surgery, Lord God, that it will be successful, Lord God, in everything that the surgeon will do, Lord God. You just guide him, Lord God, and be able to have a speedy recovery for her today, Father God. And we just pray that your your hands will be upon her, Lord God. And we just give you the glory. And the honor, Lord God, we haven't lift up Israel to you, Father, Lord God, that we stand by Israel's side, Lord God. We pray for Israel, Lord God, and we bless, we put a blessing upon Israel, Lord God, because you said to, you said that you're, those are your people, Lord God, and we stand with your people, Father, Lord God, and we thank you, Lord God, for what you're going to do, Lord God. We even thank you that we can see that your signs and wonders that your day that you you're coming sooner, Lord God, than than we expect, Lord God, that that we'll be 
taken up real fast, Lord God. And we won't have to be on this earth any longer, Lord God. And we thank you for what you're going to do, Lord God, even for our loved ones, Lord God, that they may come to know you, Lord God, at such a time as this, Father, Lord God, through these, through these signs and wonder, Lord God, that their eyes will open, Lord God, and the scales will be removed from their eyes, Father, Lord God. And we just want to give you the praise and the honor, Lord God, and we thank you, Lord God. Just be with us, Lord God, through the rest of the week, Lord God. And just let your spirit just draw us closer, Lord God, and continue to grow us into men and women that you have called us to be, Father, Lord God. Kingdom men and kingdom women, Lord God, so we can raise kingdom families, Lord God, for you, Father, Lord God. And we just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We love you guys. We will see you here next week. Uh, Shannon's Aunt Cynthia will bring in the final topic, which will be the church next week. So tune back in next week, 730. Love y'all. Have a great night.